We're here today with Ken Rees and we are going to discuss some esoteric subjects and today we're going to discuss Christian esotericism and exotericism. So Ken, thank you very much for joining us and I wondered if you could explain a little what Christian esotericism is. Well, I've deliberately chosen this topic because, or the title, um, because I want to challenge my own title. Um, I, I think the whole distinction between esotericism and exotericism, at least as it applies to Christianity, um, can be contested. And I, I think it's a contestability which is, is not usually um, presented within any context, uh, basically. I mean, I could be wrong because I'm certainly not on top of and don't claim to be on top of um, any particular theological journal or religious studies journal or I indeed um, any particular Christian community where such is discussed uh, but I'd be surprised if um, my view is a majority view uh, I'd even be surprised if my view is a minority view um, and it would be perhaps good to, to open my provocative and challenging uh, viewpoint, which I think it is, uh, to wider audiences to see what they think and, and this I'd be quite happy to have Christians and non-Christians throw in their ten penny worth or however much it is these days. Um, it, it, it's a view I'm still developing, so uh, th this presentation may sound a bit hesitant because I'm actually almost literally thinking on my feet, except I've got my feet up at the moment. This is humour, by the way, for people who haven't heard me speak at various colleges before. Um, and uh, a year or so ago, I don't think I'd be talking quite like this, but I have increasingly moved over the last year to criticising classification in general, particularly spiritual and religious classification, uh, as I say particularly, and feeling that uh, the whole um, matter of classification can sometimes uh, mystify rather than clarify. So the division between the esoteric and the exoteric is just a, a, a limiting case of the wider issue of labelling, categorization, and, and as I say, classification. Uh, so I, I think the whole um, notion of classification can be challenged. I'm not going to do that today because I've already done it. And um, if anyone's interested, I can always uh, give uh, the interviewer here, uh, Miss Warden, a, a, a copy of my talk to the Alistair Hardy Society and Classification, which I gave last year in Flantarnam Abbey. So I'm not going to repeat anything of that, because we're focusing on the esoteric and exoteric, and within that, even more specifically, esoteric and exoteric Christianity. So... Um, I've been brought up in the context, in the atmosphere of fundamentalist Christianity. I'm currently, uh, over the last two years, been visiting a uh, Christian denomination which would probably consider itself fundamentalist. I'm not sure that it does, but I suspect it would do if I asked them. They come over as being fundamentalist. And uh, uh, the other word here is literal, literalist. Now, I think the parallel terminology here is if it's ex exoteric, it is literal. Now, I can't think of a single person I've met, or even generally something I've read, which literally takes the Bible, we need to talk about the Bible because we're talking about Christianity, Literally, I don't know a single person who takes the Bible literally, um, 
obviously they're going to be parts of it they take literally if they are fundamentalists but to me it's an insult to call um, fundamentalist Christians literalists as if they don't know uh, that Christ also uses similes also uses metaphors also uses allegorical speaking and thinking um, so that's the first challenge if you like that I don't think there's any such thing as literal Christianity so ipso facto uh, in a way there's no such thing as exoteric Christianity if one has to hang on to these labels then I would say all Christianity is esoteric to a lesser or greater degree if you look at the um, various thinkers uh, um, about uh, Christianity uh, like Emanuel Swedenborg like Dionysus uh, the era Paygate and various other people which one of course can look up uh, on Wikipedia these days one will see that they have different levels of interpretation one of which is historical another one is literal another one is metaphorical another one is allegorical another one is metaphysical etc so which one of these is esoteric are they all esoteric are they all literal are some esoteric others literal how do we decide okay the average churchgoer may never have heard of Swedenborg unless of course they're Swedenborgians still less, less are they likely to have heard of Dionysus or if they have they think of him as the Greek god which this is someone quite different uh, but that's not really the point um, the, the point is um, I, I'm speaking as an English language person but I'm sure that the, the same thing would work in other languages that if you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament we have figures of speech we have interpretations which can be taken in a whole variety of ways as I've just uh, spoke, said to Miss Warden before we started this podcast I have a book here which I've been reading which quotes a verse totally out of context in support of their thesis that this verse I think it's from Genesis is to do with Freemasonry um, well what does one do well I know what I do I check my concordance in one of the um, one of the Bibles I was going to say one of the numerous Bibles I have I don't have so many nowadays because I threw a lot of them out because they were my mother's and I didn't have room for them but the, the book uh, which has got the main concordance in uh, I checked the verse in there and as I expected this verse was put in the context of a whole set of other verses both in the same um, chapter and also references to other chapters in other parts of the same book of Genesis or even elsewhere uh, uh, so the danger is because these people these authors I think to some extent consider their esotericists uh, that one can take a verse out of context interpret any which way you want call it esoteric or indeed not esoteric and where are you going to be and I think this this kind of confusion is actually assisted by distinctions which aren't necessarily any va any more valuable now than they were in the past. Now I think um, there are people who have um, sort of interpreted the Bible, particularly the New Testament, in a one-dimensional way. Uh, and I would put someone who most hearers probably have never heard of here and this is a woman called Anna Kingsford uh, when I first discovered that again there'd be a separate podcast on her should um, should Miss Warden want it from me no we'll but, do Anna Kingsford who but, was a theosophist so I'll just quickly add that in for people to know but a Christian theosophist but well, carry on Kim yeah her Christianity I thought was really great when I first read her most well known book on it uh, The Perfect Way but increasingly, uh, and perhaps there is a bit of a perhaps there, I've got critical of her because I think it's a bit one-dimensional her approach uh, to the interpretation of, um, well, largely New Testament really, because I think she leans over backwards, 
if she could do that, I don't know if she could, that's also meant to be funny, um, to, to be metaphorical, metaphysical, um, abstract, uh, and that to me is, is again, going too far the other way. I mean, in her antipathy uh, or opposition to the kind of Anglicanism she was brought up on and indeed married into, uh, she had the kind of overreaction which I had due to my fundamentalism except my funda my reaction was in a quite different direction altogether it wasn't even within a Christian context so I think one's really got to watch their reactions uh, to the body of work which is the Bible whether they've been brought up on, on it or whether they were taught it at school or whether they read it originally as a work of literature or whatever um, there's always going to be a psychology about the interpretation of, of biblical work uh, let, let's take a slightly different tangent on this uh, that there's a body of work uh, discovered um, particularly since the 19th century and increasingly since the 20th uh, which includes goes beyond the Gnostic Gospels as they're so called uh, and then you have the body of work which is extremely well known uh, although the technical name isn't so well known the technical name is the Synoptic Gospels. Now again there's uh, sometimes a, a a kind of conflict um, developed and, well an op opposition that's We were interrupted by a phone call so we start again now with the next session uh, One example of the confusion between the esoteric and the exoteric is the um, matter of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the vicarious atonement. Um, you get people like uh, Anna Kingsford and I believe also um, Rudolf Steiner having their own esoteric interpretations of the significance of the resurrection of the vicarious atonement. Then you get the alleged literal interpretations within the um, orthodox uh, Christian community. By orthodox I mean the Western Orthodox, I not too familiar with Eastern Orthodox so mainstream Catholic Anglican have what could be called a, a literal interpretation of the resurrection uh, so I believe I'm led to understand that um, people like Steiner and Kingsford tend to uh, take it in a much more symbolic way and um, look at the metaphysics of it and that kind of thing in the abstract sense various Gnostic traditions come up with their uh, do docetism is it called that's one angle where Christ didn't die on the cross he was never on the cross Simon was on it instead so on and so forth now the way I'd get round that it is, isn't really to dis dismiss the esoteric and exoteric um, comparative distinction I don't need to do that because my view is it doesn't matter. It doesn't have any relevance to me. Um, and this, of course, in its own terms is quite heretical. And I suppose you could say it's unbiblical. But my view is it doesn't matter if he died on the cross or not. It doesn't matter if he rose up or not. What it does matter is what he said and how he lived as a role model. That's the most significant thing. And... Uh, for thousand, well, literally 2,000 years people have got hung up on the cross in terms of what happened there and the resurrection now in my parents tradition there is a cross but there's nobody on it in the Catholic tradition and I believe in some when I say tradition I mean physical churches now physical places uh, in the Catholic tradition particularly in Spain and Italy and the Mediterranean countries there's a bleeding Christ there's a tormented Christ there's Christ on the cross. Now, from a, 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 I was going to say technical point of view, that's probably a wrong word. To me, it's much better if you're going to have a cross, don't have anybody on it. But to me, I would be, I think, again, I may be wrong here, like the Quakers. I don't think they have a cross even in there. Certainly, there are some Christian groups that don't have a cross in their building at all. 
that to me is the healthiest of all uh, and, and as I say one needs to look at what Christ said and I have one of my Bibles has everything he said in red printed in red the rest is not in red so I'd advise people to get a if they're interested in what he actually said for ease of eyesight to just look at the, the, the red text and see how he lived and the examples he gave and one can then avoid all these you can avoid that distinction between esoteric and exoteric on their very key thing in the conventional mainstream thinking both esoteric and exoteric communities you can get get around it but I say what I'm saying is totally heretical I suppose for both parties um, so I uh, I feel that I'd prefer to see the Gnostic Gospels and the Synoptic Gospels plus John as complementary I think that's a much more positive way to look at it uh, rather than say one's esoteric and one's exoteric um, I don't know why there should be such a cleavage I say this because amongst the people I've met uh, among these so-called fundamentalists they've never heard of the Gnostic Gospels uh, yeah, or dismissed them and amongst the people who are really into the Gnostic Gospels in some ways they seem to think it's superior to the synoptic and I, again I think this is a straw man or in this gender free days a straw woman if you want I don't see the point of putting up such an argument uh, so again this is of a type of esoteric versus exoteric uh, and I think far more constructive work could be done by taking the Gnostic and the Synoptic in tandem, which for, to my, for all I know, it probably has been done. I'm sure there are um, well-versed, that's not meant to be a pun, but uh, well-versed writers who have written texts. Uh, I've just never come across them. Or maybe maybe I should write one, but uh, far too lazy to do that. Um, but it seems to me they complement each other, particularly the Gospel of Thomas, uh, it's almost as good as, which is a strange expression perhaps, uh, as uh, the, the synoptic gospels, isn't it? So you could add that on, uh, have it as an add-on if one wants. Um, but we only uh, really have the gospels that are in the Bible now because of that Nicene Council, wasn't it, where they decided which gospels they wanted in. So really it was just a, a group of men that went, we don't want these ones, we want these ones. Well, I wonder if it was a different type of set of people, maybe a more free thinking or more willing to look at all the different types of Gospels we would have had perhaps a different set of Gospels in the Bible I, I think the, uh, a highlighted problem which uh, to me cuts right across the esoteric and exoteric distinction rather than supports it but it could be, could be argued quite the opposite which I've just said that Yes, with, with the Synoptic Gospels and the um, 26 books, is it? 26 books of the old New, New Testament as a whole, you have not just the Nicene Council, but you've got a whole battery of councils, haven't you, over the centuries and synods, uh, which make decisions about uh, translations. Um, yes, and what books should be in uh, the Jews did the same with their Old Testament and decided by a, a small vote, I believe, that a book like Enoch should not be in. And then you get Catholicism, which includes some books which the Protestants only put in the Apocrypha. So you, you've got that kind of um, variable which uh, can make things more complicated um, I, I think the Gnostic Gospels as far as we know I mean much of them were hidden weren't they or they seem to be in hiding which is one meaning of the word esoteric but not generally the meaning we're talking about today I don't think they were hidden in an occult sense in a cave or underneath the ground that kind of thing um, uh, it, possibly because the people who buried them felt they were going to be persecuted some people bring in the Essenes that's always good for pu publicity isn't it if you bring in the Essenes uh, and the Knight Templars you have to bring them in as well but for, even forgetting them 
I, I think there is a kind of softer touch to the Gnostic Gospels in various ways. Um, but I, I'm not sure there isn't still some arbitrariness about it. I mean, we do know that the names that the Gnostic Gospels took were even more arbitrary. I mean, the names of uh, the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary and so on, uh, those people had been dead and gone, if they have existed, by the way. Uh, so they were put on the books to add some kind of authority, some kind of legitimacy, without being blasphemous, I hope. If they'd been called the Gospel of John Smith or Fred, they might not have had the same weight even in those days. Um, so I think the... Um, the I want to call I want, I think I have the distinction of hard and soft um, again just off the top of my head that there was a hard approach to the institutionalization of the the four gospels including John in the New Testament uh, decided by yeah committee and what a pity we weren't flies on the wall to hear how they came to those decisions. But I think by the time the Nicene um, Council was in full swing, they already knew there were competing sects, uh, hence what later be called, later became known as Gnosticism, and decided uh, historically, as we know, uh, to have a, 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 an approach to orthodoxy which constructed the New Testament within um, those limits of the 26 uh, books. Um, so I think the whole process isn't arguable, uh, but I don't think that's really the main feature of this presentation, rather the feature goes back to interpretations, doesn't it? I mean, we've got to, I've got the copies of the Gnostic Gospels next door I've got at least three different copies of the Gospel of Philip I think it's the Gospel of Philip and they're all different indeed one of them is in Greek so that makes four uh, so how do you choose between which Gnostic Gospel is the one you want to use for whatever purposes the problem stays the same really and indeed you've got the, the problems of um, translation through different languages too uh, and that's T-O um, no sorry it's T-O-O uh, so I, I think uh, I'd rather put them all together in some ways in terms of the overarching issue does the exoteric esoteric interpretation at the end of the day really help when both sets of gospels need in, in, need hermeneutics actually need interpretative skills uh, or shall we take the Gnostic Gospels literally now who's ever heard of taking the Gnostic Gospels literally if one goes to a, a setting and I know one or two where uh, the, the Gnostic Gospels may be discussed at least in passing and someone stands up and say oh well this literally means that I would think there'd be one or two smiles because uh, it's England so people be polite and smile um, so again I come back to this growing feeling that um, as far as Christianity and it probably applies to other things as well it probably applies to Islam and Buddhism of all I know that this distinction becomes less and less useful for me so I, I'm increasingly in my reading of um, of the texts in and around the Bible and Christianity, not using it. I'm, I'm actually not using it. I, I, I socially, I will use it because um, I've also, until recently, belonged to a group which would call themselves esoteric Christians, or some of the individuals would call themselves esoteric Christians. So socially, one has to use it, I suppose, or one has to be in it, uh, rather. But in terms of reading. I don't tend to write very little about this area yet, if ever. Um, but in terms of reading, I, I don't find a useful, um, increasingly a useful distinction, really. Um, well, would you I, say, like these esoteric Christians, they're looking at the 
gospels or the books that they're reading differently to what let's say mainstream christianity is reading the books or gospels or how they're reading it oh i i, I undoubtedly they are yes i mean i'm only speaking for myself and how i'm proceeding my own studies that um you know it's up to them if they want to dogmatically say this is esoteric and that is exoteric then it is, of course it's entirely up to them but what would be the difference in in esoteric and exoteric for for me i always believed the esoteric was the hidden message in the book in the story and the exoteric was more just the main story that people take literally would you agree with that or would you have a another way of saying it well, I think the main story which people take literally would have to be grounded, this is for me, in history and in archaeology. Um, and you, you, you do have books like the excellent Werner Keller, The Bible's History, which is quite an old book now, I think it's about 50 years old. Um, uh, so history can support the so-called literal interpretation um, and, and so, so, so does archaeology um, uh, but yeah I mean as we've got those disciplines already do we then have to use the word exoteric which is not a discipline I mean it's just a word it's a word for convenience I mean to me it's not exoteric to me, exoteric, it's not exoteric, it's historical and archaeological. <laughs> okay. So with um, esotericism, would you say that would be a more of a hidden meaning to the story? Or an extra meaning, something deeper? I think the way... the Well, the short answer is yes, but big qualification. The way the esoteric is used within Christian understandings I feel it opens the door to read into a verse or a chapter or even a whole book what you want to read into it and these authors admit with their own thesis I mean their own thesis is quite different to anything we're discussing here but you've read the book too and you met them um, but they admit they could be accused of reading in wish fulfillment, reading into certain things, including the verses in the, in the Old Testament. Um, so I think that um, what is deeper depends on how far you go into the well, and there's more than one well. In my exploration survey of different versions of esoteric Christianity, their labels, not mine. It, there was varied as the exoteric literal. I mean, there's as many competing interpretations, if not more, amongst the esoteric, uh, Swedenborg, Steiner, Bailey, um, Blavatsky. Uh, there's, there's as many competing. It doesn't help to me purely on... Um, I'm tempted to use the word truth, or I said, no, it's very dangerous. Okay, reality. Just on, on the actual reality level, I don't think esoteric and exoteric is useful because there's as many interpretations on the so called esoteric as there is on the exoteric. So, again, I, I go back, if you want, to complementarity. But uh, even that's not good enough. I think tandem. But to me, to actually vanish, it doesn't exist. So it's not a complement. It's, there's no binary. The binary is now gone. So therefore, there's no complementarity. There's no opposition. One just reads. Um, that's not the reason why I'm reading this, actually. But I mean, uh, it would be the reason socially that uh, I actually visit and have visited. Uh, and in the past, of course, well, Kingswood was a bit different. I, I stumbled. I can't remember how I stumbled across her. Um, I mean, there was no project in it. It's not a project now. But if you like, my understanding is growing. For me, by, I mean, while I was in Eastbourne, I went to a, a branch of this particular fundamentalist group. 
but I always learn something. Um, I, I try to filter out what is literally nonsense, which they believe or seem to believe. I mean, in this sermon, they don't call it a sermon, by the way, they reckoned that when Christ comes again, I mean, this may be a popular view, but I've never heard it before. It's probably a Catholic view, actually. No, an anti, it's anti, anti-Catholic view. This man said, sweet old man, he said, when Christ comes again, he'll be seen as the Antichrist by the Pope. What? Uh, and these aren't the sort of guys you question, you do not question these but people. They thought that before, didn't they? I think, is it, just, oh, I forgot the name, of the, I think it's a Russian writer who wrote that story about um, Jesus coming back in the inqui- time of the Inquisition and the in- Inquisition tortured him because they couldn't believe they saw him as an imposter how dare he pretend to be Jesus and he was or the Christ not Jesus but be Christ and so he was condemned for being a heretic it's it's a quite a a big theory that if he did come back now many people wouldn't recognize him because how dare he try to be the Christ well this is also the same as the Maitreya Benjamin Krems thing isn't it Mm. Um, I think the real literalism is around the good example here is is it in Matthew I think it's in Matthew no one knows the time that I he will come because he will come as a thief in the night okay you tell me about your Jehovah's Witnesses how many times are they given exact date and exact place and made to look bloody stupid um, that to me is the the uh, the, the laughable uh, dangers of the real literalism. That literalism around there, and uh, I think even they don't do that anymore. Even they don't do it anymore, because uh, the other literalism I don't think is is necessarily significant. Um, because uh, I was up at Thornton Heath last year. Because there's one of these fundamentalist churches there. There's probably more than one. Not Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. Uh, and I, I spoke to a nice couple. Uh, seemed to be very educated, very intelligent. But they immediately started talking about Adam and Eve in a literal manner. And this didn't worry me at all. Because um, I just metaphorized it. I understood where they were coming from. And I could, I felt I can handle it in my way by making it a metaphor. So it doesn't matter to me if their understanding is literal. It doesn't mean that my understanding is it's more nuanced, I suppose, but it doesn't mean it make it more sophisticated, really. Um, it, it doesn't stop me believing the same thing as they do, should I choose to believe it. I'm not saying I do or not. Um, but the the understanding is on one of these different six levels, you know, that's why I like people like Swedenborg and Dionysus and so on, that operate uh, with five or six different levels. And I don't think the majority of the esoteric people do. Uh, In that sense, they're no more sophisticated than the literalists. Uh, They have their own particular line of interpretation, which in, in, in this division is esoteric. And it's always totally different because it's to do with symbolic thought what they choose to interpret esoterically is more likely to be symbols because symbols by definition lend themselves to many different levels and many different esoteric viewpoints so you're going to get um, organisations falling out on, the, on those levels, never mind the structural levels or whatever, the, the, the secular levels, as we've discussed before the podcast started, you're going, to, you're going to get schism. So you're going to get as much schism as we do uh, in the, the so-called esoteric Christianity world, and I think in Judaism too, uh, as you do in the literal. So I can't see there's any advantage. I mean, I can't see any advantage at any level, and I'm getting more heated about this now. I think this is great. Um... I can't say any advantage on any level of using this distinction anymore and it should be banished. That's, that's in terms of religious thought. I'm not talking about other areas. And of course, one uses the word occult and arcane as partly synonymous, but not quite synonymous with esoteric. So 
if one wants to tease out the hidden means of the Beatitudes, then one can. Uh, but I think it's better to do it for oneself if one needs to do that. Or if one looks at someone like Steiner, if that helps, if it doesn't help, then think about why it doesn't help. Uh, or uh, just take the Beatitudes on its face value. To me, there's nothing wrong with face value. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lack of... The, the, the full reality needs a unity um, between the esoteric and the exoteric. And that's never going to happen. It can only happen in individual souls, if you like. It's not going to happen in a group by... You only need two people to disagree. Uh, so the main thing is to avoid groups or else compromise compromise and translate so when I go to this esoteric group which I no longer go to by the way um, I can either translate some of their points into what could be called the exoteric version and then feel at home or just think you're, you're completely wrong or I can go along with an es esoteric insight which I hadn't had from the exoterics and similarly as I've said in the Thornton Heath example I can translate their literal um, point of view in Adam and Eve to a metaphorical and feel comfortable but if there's too much of a compromise I stop going to either and by and large I'm in a position now where I'm stopping to go going to either I did go to one in Eastbourne because I was visiting Eastbourne, but that was unusual. I've stopped going to the one uh, fairly locally here, partly because I felt like a break and partly because the weather hasn't been good and partly I was sort of not feeling great with the chest and so on and so forth, partly because I don't trust the car, partly because I don't trust the ankle. So lots of reasons not to go and not just the one. And I missed some good talks. I mean, one was on sin. Another one was on Jerusalem. In fact, I was almost certainly go to on Jerusalem Wednesday. By uh, was it Wednesday? Uh, no, it was on no, it was on Sunday, which it should be. But I, I was too lazy to go. I thought I'd do do some washing instead. Um, uh, go with the flow. Uh, so some very interesting talks to me. Jerusalem, sin. There was one on the pre-existence of Christ. All those I could have gone to and got something out of. But who knows, and they may come up again, they're being, being recorded. Um, but on not, none of those examples would a, a distinction between esoteric and exoteric I, I found useful. I mean, I've got my own definition of sin, and I think it derives from the Greek, and I think they would have been onto it, because they're pretty good on the Greek. I mean, this is the fundamentalist. Um, the other lot, I don't know where they are. But do you um, think, um, when you go to these kind of talks, for some people, it would come across in the esoteric, in the exoteric way because maybe they don't want to go in too deep with with their own thoughts or their feelings. They're just quite happy to be told, not necessarily what to think, but told the basics. Where esotericism is maybe more for people that want to go even deeper, like you say, look into it for themselves. Some of the some of the most intellectual people I've met on the exoteric wing some of my father's colleagues some of the thickest people I've met on the esoteric it's because of neediness in, in both cases that one in both totally different esoteric, exoteric both people looked upon me as a seeker now this is their projection it's their projection of their own neediness uh, this is almost a semi-podcast to me, to be a seeker there's lots of motives for this but one is emptiness inside. Um, another one is just curiosity. Now, curiosity, yeah, uh, me personally, I like ideas. I'm interested in ideas and how can people believe peculiar ideas like these guys. Um, but I think if one is a seeker, it can also imply that one's needy. And I like to think I'm not in that way. I'm talking about metaphysically needy now. Metaphysically needy of the need for certainty and that is very dangerous because there's no certainty the only certainty is that one is born 
and one dies. Okay, one can talk about taxation and so on, but there's many places in the world where you don't get taxed, so that doesn't work. Um, so metaphysical certainty, to me, is a frightening thing. Um, uh, so from that point of view, Gnosticism is totally out. Anything Gnostic is totally out. Rather, it is a Gnostic, or depending on pronunciation, agnostic, but agnostic is best. Uh, so, I mean, this may change, but again, for me personally, because it's my presentation, uh, it is one doesn't know, and the absence, absence of not knowing, for me, I like to keep on looking here and there, but it's not because of need for certainty, it's not looking for certainty, it's looking for a more, if you wish, though it sounds a bit snobbish, a bit more refined nuance appreciation of the scriptures if you like and talk to keeping with it in the new testament now prime out and the old testament too so if i'm more refined and that to me is emotional as well it's not just intellectual the main root is intellectual but it then for me becomes emotional as well because one it's an arbitrary thing to break up intellect mind body spirit that's a bit arbitrary too that's another classification actually um, so my process if you want and this is really about process is is increasingly to dismiss to repeat the third or fourth time to a point of boredom for you uh, to to vanish to make invisible this distinction because it gets in the way what you do instead get people who 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 got different psychologies uh, they've got the psychology of perhaps wanting to go deeper, yes, but what's the motive for them to want to go deeper? It could be a reaction formation against their too literal, too fundamental childhood. Or it could be, like I say, a need for certainty, which is couched in a language which they find acceptable, whereas they can't find acceptable the more to them less deep um, you know le less deep um, script uh, really um, so I think one's always got to I mean I know someone whose philosophy is is he, 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 he would call it Gnostic and uh, it, it is it is Gnostic in, 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 in many of the older academic definitions of Gnosticism perhaps not so much now but his if you like metaphysical philosophy, to my mind, I know him fairly well, I knew him fairly well, fits his particular psychological outlook. So it's 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 a good fit. Um, I've no idea if mine does or not, because I'm not sure I have a philosophy in that sort of way. But his philosophy, uh, as you'd expect, really includes going to conferences, attending meetings, even proselytizing to some extent. So from that point of view, I, I don't have a philosophy in that kind of way, but I, I engage his philosophy, absolutely, because I want to know where he's coming from in terms of the, the philosophy that he holds. Uh, and, and I respect it, but because, again, by definition, his psychology is different to mine, then I would not relate to it in the same way at all, so the relationship is different. Therefore, he's in the social grouping, and I... By and large, I'm not. I mean, I'm flirt with it. It's one of my flirtations. So do you find that um, for your own um, studies of occultism and esotericism, that Christianity has helped you understand more of where your beliefs are in, what uh, a divine source is, or what a Christ force is, or the Christ power? No. No, I wouldn't look for it there. Um, I would look for it much more to where I was a few days ago and that was walking on the South Downs. So being out with nature, being with the, just with your own thoughts and with the planet? With That's nature. one area. Mm -hmm. I mean, my exploration of this, and, and as you know others, is because I love ideas and I like to know where ideas come from and the origins of ideas, as indeed these people are doing, of course, in their own way, they're doing that too. Um, so the history of ideas, 
is to me fascinating but I perhaps tend to choose more likely to choose religious spiritual ideas because of my own background uh, I'm, I'm less interested in political ideas and it's perhaps I don't know if that's good or bad at the present time in the politics um, so I like to think I know myself fairly well for that but that doesn't exclude having uh, an intellectual understanding of divinity too but if I going back to the five year thing in quite a different context I wouldn't at all be surprised if I finished up under another label for some people in five years time and that would be mystic um, but that cannot be pushed upon me that cannot, cannot be told me that I have to work through to that point should it be that point if it's not that point then I've missed it uh, uh, I've left it too late but it, it wouldn't totally surprise me if I became more and more um, involved in more the unity of everything and, and the mystical as opposed for instance to the magical aspect of things that wouldn't surprise me but What's, uh, in Joseph Campbell's term up to a point I'm following my bliss in this area uh, I mean I've now to my amazement only the last two days got fascinated by Egypt and it's, it's, I think it's slightly due to these guys but not much and I've under this my mother gave me this book in 2001 or 2002 what did I do I put it on the shelf I haven't opened it and this is the ancient Egypt well, myth and history book by because I have this Geddes and yeah, uh, I thought, Gommies, isn't it? my mother yeah. got me this uh, in a sale I think and I thought oh, thanks mum but I'm not, I've got no interest in Egypt at all none and it's been on the shelf for 18 years and now I can hardly put it down it's really almost disturbing where's it come from? What, what is it about the I don't know. ancient you just suddenly have been drawn towards it well, for example for myself I've been drawn towards Egypt from a childhood I used to see Egypt stuff everywhere and thought I must know more but obviously you didn't no I couldn't stand Egypt um, oh, right. and I, I watched a program last night on Hep Shitput, uh, on, the on BBC Pharaoh. 9 uh, and Channel 9 BBC 4 fascinating Valley of the Kings mm-hmm I mean, I think that there is a trigger. They've partly been a trigger. I can't believe uh, it was just them because there is, of course, Egypt and the Bible go together. And I just had to add because you're saying they, because readers, do, um, listeners won't know that you're talking about Christopher Knight's books. Yes. With, um, I think it's Robert Lomas. Yes. So he, they've sort of directed you a little bit towards Egypt and Egyptology. So do you find, um, have you been reading the, about the. Egyptian gods and goddesses myths and things like that. Oh, I'm, you know? I'm, I mean, I knew the Isis Osiris thing already. And um, seven years ago, I started a new course at the Mary Ward Centre called the Mystery Traditions. So I did that for two or three years before I got bored. Uh, and this included the Mithras, Dionysian, Eleusian, uh, the British Mysteries, Druidism. And I thought, hmm, people are going to expect me to do the Egyptian mystery. I don't know, I don't know about that. So anyway, I thought, well, maybe I should think about doing the Egyptian mysteries. So I got a fantastic book from the library by Arthur Vers- Verslius, which he wrote at the age of 28, called The Egyptian Mysteries. Amazing book. I don't have it. I got it from the library. I'll take it back. Made copious notes, about 12 pages of notes put it in that book, the notes I mean, and forgot all about it until yesterday, just about to yesterday, this 2004, or 2004 I got the book, although I didn't actually think about his book, I didn't think about doing the course, and I thought, well, I've got the course, um, I've got the course, shall I include the Egyptian mysteries or not, and I got all these notes, but I just, and I thought, in the end of the day, I thought, no, I can't do it, I'm not that interested in Egypt, I have no feeling for it. So I got someone that you may know. I don't know if I'm allowed to say her name on there or not. Anyway, I got someone that you may know to do it for me. She did it for me. However, she actually had an an accident with a, a glass frame in the back office of the Mary Ward, and I've never been allowed to go there since. I was really annoyed with her. 
because now I can't go in the back office. Um, but the, the lecture, I didn't think much of it, but students did. One or two students thought it was okay. And I think she even did some handouts. So that was good. So that, I've got that off the hook. I don't want to do bloody Egypt. I've got no interest. I can't stand those funny artwork and that funny thing. Uh, and now it's... You've got the bug. <laughs> it's weird. It's really weird, you know. So I think what I'm saying is, although in a sober way, I'm saying I've got these interesting ideas, there's a sense in which this has almost come up from nowhere. And part of my imagery of people is that we've all got our own cauldrons. I get this partly from Celtic tradition, mm -hmm. the Celtic myths. We've all got our own cauldron. We've all got our own womb, men as well. And every so often, something is spun out the cauldron, which we have to pay attention to. And which this is where creativity comes from. Creativity comes from the cauldron in ourselves. I'm pointing here because I'm doing, being literal. To your, it's a point to your solar plexus, where your womb or yes, so yeah. Area. So for me, creativity bursts out of this. So my courses are my children, you see. So I, I'm not jealous of women giving birth because I feel I'm giving birth. I've almost run out. I can't think of many courses to do now. But um, they're my children. Uh, 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 but then I'm a very bad father because after three years, I get rid of them. Uh, so um, I, I see this interest. Okay, there's a trigger. Yeah, there's often a trigger. But at the same time, there's, you must be the same, Debbie. You've got books in your shelf you haven't read. The time comes when you do read them. And that, you didn't read them before because it was in the right time. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I read... Um, what is it now? Um, I just want to give an example. It's like book angels, isn't it? That's what John michel used to say. The book you want would suddenly appear in the library or the bookshop. There's that as well, or yeah. Or suddenly, as you say, at the right time, Robert Graves that did, book yeah. wants, to, wants to be read, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's a, um, a book I just started to read and think, I've got to read this again. Was it a complete book or just a note? Because only today, it's in the memory, it's definitely gone. Um, oh, it was, it was Night. It was Gareth Knight. Um, inner uh, mysteries of the inner worlds, uh, and I've had that since 1977. I have read it. It is true. I've read it perhaps once or twice, but again, I, I needed to refer to Dionysus. Uh, I found the wrong references. It happened, but anyway, at 12:30, doing it just before lunch, and I thought I, I tend to pencil everything I read. Usually, I pencil so a lot. Um, especially this, these people, but these are all critical pencils and pens. Now, Gareth Knight, I could see I'd read it before. I thought, this isn't quite a good book, I must read it again. And I think each time you read the same book, you get more out of it, or you get something different out of it. But going back, yeah, so ideas then propel me, really. And I think my motives, it was in a talk which unfortunately you didn't go to, and perhaps I didn't, you didn't know it was on because I'm not even sure I had your email, I don't know. But I gave a talk for Nova Stella, just on me, my magical career. Mm -hmm. And I did say, and I think I do this quite well, I like to think I always know why I'm in a particular setting for a group. So, and I suspect my reasons for being at the esoteric Christianity and my reasons for being at the exoteric Christianity are very different to almost all of them probably all of them, unless there's some kind of journalist turns up, and I'm not a journalist, of course, so they've got their own different reasons, but I can feel it. There's some very hungry people. There's very hungry people in some of these esoteric um, groupings. The fundamentalists, on the other hand, they feel they've got the food, but to me, they're suffering from indigestion. And that's not a bad metaphor, is it? Mm -hmm. um, so they are still hungry, but they're being fed by the sermon which is given so they come every week to be fed. Um, these other groupings, uh, I think they're actually more needy because they haven't found the certainty. The fundamentalists are uh, dogmatic in their certainty. Um, either way, I, I know why I'm there and I'm comfortable in the position I'm in, which is different to either set at the moment and I can't see that changing because I think for me to commit myself more fully there is another level beyond member 
uh, for one of these groups and then you have to start paying money um, that's not the thing that would stop me but it would be suggest that I'd be I, I think I'd be a hypocrite because it would mean I'm on the same level as them or to think I am and that I'm uh, stop my criticism or whatever my criticism is always very polite <laughs> and constructive with the other lot um, I think I'd be, it would be too much of a compromise with the fundamentalists it would be too much of a compromise with the esoteric lot I think I'd be a hypocrite I think something like that and in both cases and it goes the other way too in both, both, both are actually true so I think I've only got two options at this point in time I've only got two options one is to stay as I am, which is the comfort zone option, which I like very much, or start my own group, which over the years, although starting my own group would be a very different kind of group to the groups I've started in the past or start tried to start, because in some ways they're quite easy to start because they're not they're not dependent on they're not dependent on on intellectual ideas by and large. They're not even dependent on beliefs. Whereas I think both the esoteric people and the exoteric people, I'm only using that distinction for convenience, but they are different. Then they're both dependent on beliefs. The esoteric people claim they don't have any beliefs, but they certainly do. And I don't need beliefs, really. I, I hate the idea of belief. I mean, actually, that's rubbish. Um, I've been brought up with such a strong set of beliefs, many of which are absolutely vile, I well, I just didn't need beliefs. I mean, I I don't need the I I find them fascinating. I find it fascinating why people believe in reincarnation. The last salon I had, this discussion was on reincarnation. It wasn't led by me, led by a particular person, ex student, uh, in the class. And I find and no one there seemed to believe in reincarnation, properly. I mean, it was a good discussion, or maybe they did, but they didn't want to discuss it. I don't know. So I, I find it fascinating people believing in reincarnation. But I, fas I find beliefs fascinating. So that's my interest, if you like. Um, that sort of how can someone believe this? Or not really the answer's there. I believe this because it gives me certainty, it gives me comfort, so on. And that's great. Um, but one of the things I like about the fundamentalist group is that in contrast to the majority of fundamentalist groups, as I understand them, and in some cases I've met them, the typical beliefs they don't have they don't believe in them either and they think it's fantastic what a fantastic group unfortunately the central themes they do but I mean they're great they, they, they don't believe in hell they don't believe in heaven they don't believe in the devil uh, so really it's what people don't believe I really like <laughs> yes I like to ask people when they say something like that well why don't you believe it what is or you're not saying that I definitely believe but I'd like to know why people don't think these things might exist or why these things aren't ah, about. With the fundamentalist lot, they refer me to the Bible and they quote me chapter and verse and say, we don't believe that because it's not biblical. And they're right in terms of, as I can see, they're right. You know, it's great. They say, when you're dead, you're dead. Unless, so yeah, that's all right. You won't go to heaven, Kenneth. I know that. Good, yeah. And unlike my mother, you won't go to hell either. So it's great, what a great group. So if when you're dead, you're dead, maybe we have to make the most of this life and that's why people do have that hunger that you were talking about earlier to know more because they know this is the one life so we've got to try and get to know everything just in case there is a way out. Or well, there is something after life but we need the knowledge to do the, the next stage. Well, maybe. Mind you, the, the, the esoteric group, they're... Mm, I don't think they've got a ban against alcohol and they're not very joyful. In fact, I would say the fundamentalist group are more joyful than the esoteric group in some ways. I don't know, it depends who you talk to, I suppose. Um, but, I'm, you know, I'm not really doing a sociological study. That's how I started with all these things. Well, no. I mean, in terms of visiting groups, yes, that's how I started. But I've long. But I can't help also being the sociologist. And some of these groups, both fundamentalist and esoteric, are dying out. They're all dying out. Sounds to me the Theosophical Society as well, by the sound of it. I mean, the average age of the fundamentalist group was 75. Uh, and there was another fantastic esoteric group 
the best one I've ever met. This is esoteric Christianity now. And they, they, they no longer exist effectively. They have to sell their wonderful temple, 18 pillars that really affected me. Uh, their, their interpretation of, well, particularly the New Testament, is the closest you can get as a continuity with Anna Kingsford, but it's not Anna Kingsford. There's one or two of their books over there. But they were just fantastic. Um, so why uh, would you say they died out? They just couldn't get new blood in? It was just... Both. Uh, well, yeah, that's a little bit like Swedenborg too. Most of them, when I asked them where they come from, my family was in it. You know, my generations were in it. Swedenborg mm -hmm. like that too. The ones I go to in Brixton, been to two or three times. But they couldn't, there was no point. Small numbers in a wonderful house, wonderful house with a warden, very much like a Theosophical Society building out in Kensington Way, I think it was. In the Kensington. Wonderful place. Um, I just fell in love with the building because I like buildings. Um, uh, so I was nosy about the places people meet. Um, I mean, this, this fundamentalist group down here in London, the place I go to, I haven't been this year, is an old Victorian theatre. Very small, but a local, old local Victorian theatre. How quaint, you know, sort of how cute. I mean, that affects me, the buildings that they have things in. Whereas both this lot, the Eastbourne lot, and this other lot with the Great House, they're reduced to meeting in other people's houses. Well, I don't want to do that. Especially when it's way out in Ealing. Mm -hmm. But it is nice to go to buildings that are built especially for this kind of thing or set out for this kind of thing. It may have it been. It has an atmosphere. Yeah. If there's nobody actually living in it, but it's being used for... Well, the warden lived for. there. Of course, she was a member, of course, mm -hmm. you see. So that was... Um, a very rich experience uh, and I never knew they existed. I was given this talk 2009 maybe, before then I think. Um, I was given this talk in Anna Kingsford in a local pagan moot and this guy came up to me, he was a bit, a bit of a strange guy. He says you ought to go to so and so and I thought he was so odd he was making the name up. I thought no there's no such place. He was a really weird guy. I think there was something wrong in, in his head, in his speech. Anyway, um, I looked it up on the internet. I said, oh, no, such a place. Well, he's right, this man's right. So I, I followed it through with a phone call. And I, apart from this present fundamentalist group, I went there more often than I've been anywhere else. And then it collapsed. The whole, they had to sell their building. They couldn't afford to run it, you see. They'd been in the building since 1923. They used to have a choir, um, all sorts of things. Uh, I mean, it's probably still running at the, on this house meeting basis, but I don't like house meetings, really. I mean, I no longer have meetings here. I mean, I used to run workshops here years ago. I don't, I, I don't like many people coming in here, to be honest. <laughs> mm. well, it's your, your private castle. <laughs> yeah, um, so that was a good... But they were, I suppose they would call themselves esoteric. Uh, they didn't actually call themselves that. Beautiful artwork by by one of the people. I think it's either one here or the other room, the artwork. Um, but they didn't align themselves to any culture, so they weren't Egyptian or anything like that. Um, so, um, uh, one of the reasons I want to move to Eastbourne is I feel my work is almost done. My exploratory work is almost done. But I'm going to the Lucy's Trust, Alice Bailey lot, next month, because I want to meet Dina Gluberman, um, because I've been to her things in the Greek island. She's, she's years now than Skiros in the Greek island. So I want to see what sort of lady she is, a sort of humanistic psychologist. Um, to me, that's all part of the same thing, the visualisation. She writes book and visualisation. To me, that's a form of prayer, you see. So I want to do, keep my hand in with um, Auntie Alice. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I find her impossible to read, really. Um, so to me, I can't tie myself down. I mean... And to me, to even time myself, going back to the original point in the presentation, tying myself down to binary oppositions, which are only words, uh, increasingly, why bother? For the point of advertising, advertising courses or whatever, yeah. Um, if I advertised a course on literal, literal Christianity, how many of my present students would come? Probably nil, you know, uh, nil points. Uh, so esoteric Christianity, only a few years ago I get a full house almost, including a Swedenborgian who you probably know, a homeopath. 
um, doing research on uh, that man beginning with a W. Is it with a W? Uh, uh, it will come. It will come. Mm-hmm. Memory's definitely going for names. That's that's serious. Um, so uh, that that's my position, really. Uh, but I say I do want to restrict this afternoon to looking at religious philosophies from within that particularly um, Christianity, which I feel I know most about. I don't know much about Islamic uh, esotericism. Don't know a great deal about Sufism and so on. So whether my approach would apply, I think it might be a bit harder to apply to Islam. I suspect. I think it would be easy to apply to Buddhism. I suspect it would be all Buddhism is esoteric, if you like, in a way. <laughs> um, so it'd be easy to apply, but not so much to Islam. But I think to be blunt, people getting their nick- knickers in a twist. And what I like to do is to shove their heads together. I'd like to you know, take all the people I know in the esoteric tradition, in this group that I met with the fundamentalists and have a party and you know what would happen it would be the same with the parties out here they'd be sitting in their little group and they'd be sitting and never the twain would meet oh do you think so you don't think they might actually speak to each other and start a dialogue and perhaps see that we've got quite a bit going between us well then you'll be the one that will be encouraging them to perhaps talk to each other no no I wouldn't be I'd just have a cup of tea (laughs) well we've been speaking for well over an hour right so I wondered if I could just thank you for your talk and may you continue to be a free spirit and a true seeker. And should anybody be interested in any of your workshops, how would they find out about them? Is there a website or an email? Email is best. Okay, would you like me to add that to the end? Yes, because my next workshop will be on my own philosophy, although I don't know if it's worthy of being called a philosophy, and of course it can always change, and that's the notion of personal myth. So it is actually part of your workshop as it happens. So people should really... I hope it's advertised properly because people complained last time when I did this workshop on the fool. I wanted people to act the fool. They couldn't do it. Uh, most of them couldn't do it. So where would this be advertised? Mary Ward. Mary, Mary Ward. Ward Centre Prospectus, yeah. Mary Ward Centre Prospectus, yeah. this is in London. It is, yes. Right. Okay. Uh, and it is partly workshop, partly academic. Um, but uh, if people want to f- find their own personal myth, because we've all got a personal myth, then various exercises like drama, um, drawing and that will be facilitated. Oh, it sounds fascinating. Well, I'm sure many people will come to it. And that's going to start in the autumn? There's a limit to it. Well, there's only one course, 12 hours in September, I think it is. It's a limitation of 18 people. Okay. And it's got nothing to do with esoteric or exoteric, I don't think. (laughs) And yeah. if they wanted to enrol for that, they must go through the Mary Ward. Absolutely, yes. I, I can't that. answer questions about concessions or anything like that. Right. Let, they we'll all let go. Them do with it. If anyone's interested, get in touch with the yeah. Mary Ward people. Yeah, it could be a bit of fun. And that's Mary is in the name Mary, and then Ward, W A R D. She used to be, a, she was a philanthropist, Victorian philanthropist. Gave lots of money out, I believe. <laughs> she sounds like a good woman. Well, thank you very much, Ken, and we should do more of these. Yes. Thank you very much. It, right. the participatory yeah. stuff. Well, next time we'll have a, another exciting subject to speak about anyway. Thank you, Ken.